Dr. John W. Mitchell leads the organization's global operations and staff. Working with the IPC Board of Directors, he is responsible for assisting in the development and implementation of the board's uh, strategic vision and aspirational goals. He joined IPC as president and CEO in April of 2012. I mean, yes. 2012, that's cool, I like that. 2012, <laughs> and has been instrumental in launch, launching solutions to help IPC's members achieve financial success and competitive excellence. Dr. Mitchell has championed IPC programs such as a new learning management platform, IPC Edge, validation services, an online certification portal, and a re-engineered member success department. Dr. Mitchell began his engineering career at General Electric Aerospace in 1988. In 1992, he joined Alpine Electronics and became a founding member of its research company, which is credited for introducing navigation systems to the US OEM market. During his tenure at Alpine, he had served several positions, including manager of software engineering, director of IT, and senior director of strategic planning. In 2003, Dr. Mitchell was recruited to Boas Corporation, where he served as general manager and a director of new global business unit. Bose's largest ever product development initiative. Just prior to joining IPC, he served as the CEO of Golden Key, International Honor Society. Dr. Mitchell's academic credentials include a doctorate in higher education management from the University of Georgia's Institute of Higher Education, a Master of Business Administration from Pepperdine University, and a Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering from Brigham Young University. In addition to his academic credentials, Dr. Mitchell holds a patent in GPS navigation systems. Please let us introduce Dr. John W. Mitchell. Can you guys hear me if I just talk? Yeah. Excellent. So that sounded way too impressive uh, for me. Uh, I'm just John. Uh, uh, and so I, I'm going to walk through a few slides here quickly. But my hope is to answer any questions, all right? Have a discussion, figure out how to get you guys the best jobs you can get, uh, you know, make you as successful as possible. That's, that's, that's what gives me joy. So let's, first off, uh, could you stand up a second, Hannah? President of IPC's local chapter here, right? Yes. Yeah, so for Hannah. <laughs> Nobody introduced her. All right, so what are we doing here? Um, that's me. All right, so let me talk a little bit about uh, my past. So she talked to you a little bit about my education, some of the jobs I've done. Um, so I started off in electrical engineering as a university student. How many of you are electrical engineers? How many of you are in engineering at all? Anything? So is everybody in some sort of engineering? Okay. Um, uh, when I was an engineer, I swore I would never get an MBA because those guys were all about the money and they were the devil, right? <laughs> they were taking away that pure engineering. We were making cool stuff. We were going to solve the world's problems with this wonderful thing called engineering. And then I got into, uh, I, I went off, I was at General Electric, um, Alpine Electronics, uh, and uh, if you ever found a 1992 Honda Civic, uh, that radio, that's mine. I built that. I designed that radio. Um, and uh, it was, it, you know, there's interesting challenges along the way that you run into. So I actually traveled to Japan. Alpine is a Japanese-based company. I happen to speak Japanese. And um, as part of that, it was supposed to be a year-long uh, assignment over in Japan in which we were going to design Honda's new radio. And it was super exciting, not really, just, just a radio. Uh, and we finished in one month. And so they said, well, go test everything. Verify that what you designed is right. And so a lot of what they had done, they had, so, so Alpine, this was not the first radio that Alpine had ever built. Um, it, it, in my youth, as a high school student, I remember being about 14 or 15 years old and walking into a car stereo store 
and they had this really cool poster. I don't know if you guys have probably have never seen it. You could Google it. It's, it's a Maxell cassette tape poster, and it's this guy. It was this commercial. He's sitting in a lounge chair, and he's blasting these speakers, and his hair's blowing back, and there's this glass of, 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 of uh, liquid there, and it's blasting so far. It's slowly moving across the table, and just before it falls, he's just, just enjoying the sound, and he just reaches over and catches it takes a drink and sets it back there again. I was like, oh man, that is so cool, sound, it's awesome. And I'd walk into that store, I had the poster, and then there was these really little green uh, radios. And they were Alpine stereos. But I was 14, I, I was like, oh, I gotta have one of these. They were like hundreds of dollars at the time, which was more money than I had ever seen. And wanted one, but I didn't even have a car. So why the crud did I want this? So I was, succumbing to this brand of, uh, that they were pushing on me. A little bit later in college, I had gone down to the mall. And in the mall, they had a Bose store. Have you guys ever been to a Bose store? They used to do these really cool demos. You'd sit in there and they would play the sound. And here I am feeling like that guy from the Max L tape commercial. Like, oh, this is amazing sound. And then what they do is they do a reveal. After you listen to all this incredible sound, has these gigantic speakers on the wall. They take them off, and all they are is boxes, and there's these little speakers there making this tremendous sound. It's like, this is the coolest company ever, man. They did this really stuff right in there. And then a little bit later, while I was in college, I got involved in Golden Key International. At that time, it was National Honor Society, and I actually became the chapter president. So I, I'm sharing this because I, I found ways to get involved in different things. I found passions and things to get involved with. And this actually, totally unintentionally, became my roadmap. After GE, I joined Alpine Electronics, and I started designing car stereos. And eventually, we did GPS navigation systems and created databases and things like that. And our first GPS navigation system that we built for this country, the entire map was LA. So if you didn't buy this Honda in LA, you couldn't use the map. I mean, you just, hey, nothing. It's just gray on the screen. But, but that's how we started off selling. And they cost $3,000. And it was, it was funny. Somebody, right before we uh, did that, the head of the research uh, division that I, I worked with, he said, John, we've got this navigation stuff that we're doing in, in Asia. Do you think it'll sell in the US? And my answer was, because I have great foresight, absolutely not. <laughs> no one will ever use this garbage. $3,000? I can buy a $4 map. Why would I need this? Well, that $3,000, you can still, by the way, you can still buy navigation systems for about $3,000 if you'd like. Are you aware of this? <laughs> buy a new car and add the navigation option, and it'll cost you about three grand. Or, ta-da! It's free. Actually, it's not. You're paying for it every month. You just don't know it. Um, but uh, but that's where it went to. You know. So so I started off at uh, Alp or uh, early in my career. I was at Alpine. And then after Alpine, I was working there in many different positions, and I got this call from Bose out in Massachusetts. I was working in L.A. Obviously, because I needed a map, right? Um, but. Uh, in uh, Bose calls me up, and they're out in Massachusetts, and they said, hey, we'd like to have you come out and talk with us. Free trip to Massachusetts, man. Let's go. All right. I haven't been there in like five years. Let's go try that. So I, I went out there and interviewed, and I didn't expect to be interested in this job at all. At all. I loved it. Bose is a company of engineers. I mean, literally. Dr. Bose used to be an MIT professor. And what he would do, and he was largely touted as the best electrical engineering professor you could get over there. So he would take his favorite students and say, hey, you know what? Instead of just doing this for school, you can come over here and do some cool research and get paid. So he just pulled people into his company and made some cool stuff. But Bose, unbeknownst to most people in the world, is a research company. I was sharing that with a, a couple of you. They do research. They sell sound to pay for the research they do. I mean. He kicked it off. It's a great story. I could tell you that if, you have, if we have questions, I'm happy to share those stories. So then after Bose, um, my wife had two heart attacks toward the end of my time at Bose. I was traveling like a maniac. I was doing about 300,000 miles of air travel per year. Just 
think about that. How, how far around the Earth is it? How many miles? Anyone? Ballpark? 25, 27,000. So 10 times around the planet every year, at least. More like 13, but anyway. Um, who's the math, who are the math gurus in here? Right? Everybody just doing that in their head, not me. What, who was it? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was traveling a lot. My wife had these heart attacks associated with our, our last child being born. And so I, I went to them and I said, guys, I just can't do this travel anymore. I need to be around. And so uh, they offered me a, a job, a different position, because Bose is a really cool company. They weren't, hey, you want to be here? We'll find a place for you. I mean, what kind of company? It's just awesome. But it wasn't as interesting for me. I kind of like running things. I like being in charge. I don't know. Maybe some of you do. Maybe some of you don't. That's okay. You don't have to like that. It's just everybody has their own tastes and different uh, desires. So I started looking. And what job did I get? I found the CEO, Golden Key. At this time now, it's international. So I went from being cool Alpine stereos, amazing Bose sound demos, and president of the local student chapter of Golden Key International, uh, National Honor Society to working in and running pieces or all of those three companies. So it was just kind of a, a weird journey. And then as I finished up with Golden Key, I ended up at IPC. So IPC is a trade association. Anybody know what a trade association is? Okay. So do you know what a nonprofit is? Somebody tell me what a nonprofit is. Don't be shy, really. We're, we're going to become very intimate. I'm going to come sit next to you guys and talk to you, put my arm around you. you know. um, what's, a, what's a nonprofit? Or a nonprofit company? Go ahead. It's, like a, it's an organization with like a goal that is a profit in themselves. Okay. In general, that's the uh, common definition. Let me give you some of the specific business language on it. First, all nonprofits are companies. Churches are nonprofits. There's charities that are nonprofits. There's trade associations that are nonprofits. There's literally 27 different kinds of nonprofit organizations in the US. That's why you see 501c3, it's type number three. 501c6, a trade association is 501c6. And in our version of a, and there's some benefits to being a nonprofit. You don't have to pay federal tax. So that's a 15% bonus to you. There's some downsides too. There are no shares. So even though I'm the CEO of a nonprofit and have been of a couple, I work at the pleasure, even, even if I created this nonprofit, if the board decides to get rid of me, there's nothing I can do about it. I have no shares, no stake in it whatsoever. So there's some risk there. Anyway, so I come over, uh, I, I finish up at uh, Golden Key, which is a 501c3, a charity, so you can join, you know, students would pay and they do that and we'd write receipts and all that good stuff. That's one of, there's lots of differences in nonprofits. That's for, we'll, we'll talk about that our, on a business course, not an engineering lecture. Um, and what happened at IPC is it was almost like the juxtaposition of almost everything I'd ever done in my life, okay? Did I know, just like you guys, I didn't know what a trade association was. I didn't sit there and go, hey, hi there, I'm an electrical engineer. I hope one day I'll be the CEO of IPC, yada, da, da, da. I didn't even know how to spell IPC. Um, <laughs> they, um, but it was my electrical engineering because IPC does standards. So when you build electronics, you want to make sure that they work. And we've taken the collective knowledge of the industry and we continue this process. And in fact, you guys can even sit on these standards committees if you would like um, and learn about them. And you can learn about how to manufacture electronics so that they're reliable, so that they work, so that they handle temperatures, they handle vibration, all of those issues. I mean, you think if you're doing breadboards or just designing something and printing out a circuit board, that's lovely. But now shake it up and down while you're trying to work it, stomp on it, you know, and, and, and put it out in the freezing cold. Does it still work? Well, hey, you might be category three then. Good job. <laughs> They actually have machines that'll do all that stuff now, you know, to, in, in test situations. So, so I was using my electrical engineering because I was an electrical engineer. Next, um, it was an international organization. Just about every job I had done, I mentioned all the travel I was doing, that 300,000 miles was basically two trips to Japan every month and an occasional another trip to Italy because I was working with Ferrari to build their infotainment system. Infotainment system meaning when you get in the car, it's kind of that center stack, right? All the cool stuff that, you know, 
when I buy a car, <laughs> I don't care how many horsepower it has. I trust that's going to work. What I'm in there for is the gadgets. Does it connect? Does it do cool stuff? Then I want that car. And the automotive industry actually is starting to understand that almost 50% of the value now is in electronics. It's not in the engine anymore. It's shifting. Um, so I was, the international nature of it was cool because all the jobs I had done were international. Um, it was uh, a nonprofit. So I had just done a nonprofit. Um, what else was it? Business. So I was using my business background. I was figuring out how to use the business. Uh, and then, what am I forgetting? Engineering, business, international, nonprofit. Losing my brain. <laughs> and that other thing that's so important to me that I could never forget it. <laughs> anyway, there's another aspect. But anyway, it, it was allowing me to do all of that in a single job, even though I didn't even know this job existed. And frankly, the jobs that you're looking or hoping to get now, that's great. But the jobs in five years, half of them won't, don't exist today. So I don't ever worry about, you know, people are like, oh, I need to make sure I get the right job or I take the right path in, in my career because I, chances are you're going to change. Even though my career was uh, General Electric, Alpine, Bose, Golden Key, IPC across way too many years, a thousand years I've been working, it's amazing. Um, uh, Within, so Alpine was like 11 years. In those 11 years, I probably did six different roles, completely different roles, okay? So you can also get change within companies as well, so you can broaden your experience. Um, and anyway, so I ended up at IPC, and that's how I got here. So that's my journey. Are you okay with that? Is that good? Is that what you wanted to hear? Yeah. Okay, all right, so what's next? I talked about what we, so we do standards. I talked about standards. We do education. That's the other thing. It's education. My doctorate is in education. <laughs> How could I forget? Um, uh, yes, I'm educated. Um, so we train the industry. We actually provide some training to students too. There's more coming. You'll see. Wait till this fall. There's whole new programs we're going to be providing for you guys it's just to help you be prepared when you go get that job. You won't go. One, the number one, you're learning a lot of great stuff. So I, I preface it with that because I don't want you to think you're not. However, chances are when you go into your first job in industry, they're going to go, this kid doesn't know nothing. We're trying to help that not happen by get, bringing industry, what the industry wants you to learn in addition to your schoolwork and helping to marry that up so you can be better prepared. So we do standards, education, Advocacy. What's advocacy? Anyone? Governments. We work with governments. I have a lobbying group in DC. I have lobbyists in Brussels. I have people working with the Chinese government. You th back when I was an engineer, I thought the MBA guys were the devil. After I got my MBA, I was sure that the government guys were the devil. <laughs> And now I'm doing all that stuff. I've, I've become the devil. It's terrible. <laughs> but you, what you'll learn is every aspect is relevant to it. It's an ecosystem, okay? And you have to figure out how to play and, and work with it. And in some ways, you try to change it. So one of the things we try to do on the advocacy side is we try to go and we work with governments and we say, hey, you're about ready to make this regulation or this law or this ruling. Um, have we actually done some science to prove if that's right or not? Let, let's actually do that before you go and screw up this entire industry. Because you kind of like electronics. It'd be nice if they could continue to be made. It's also, by the way, electronics, great place to be. It's, I, I do want to tell you that I'm pretty certain in 2023, the electronics fad is not going to end. It's going to stick around a little bit longer. Uh, maybe a lot longer. So it's, it's, it's a great field. It's flexible. Um, so standards, education, advocacy, and then solutions. We talk with, we have, member, we have over 3,000 companies all over the world. We talk with them all the time. And when we hear common problems, 
which we're going to talk about a few of those, we work with the industry to try to solve those, usually utilizing standards of education or advocacy. That's who we are. You have a ton of options with an engineering degree. Okay? My um, brother-in-law said, he was uh, uh, coming out of high school, he said, I think I want to go into electrical engineering, John. You're an electrical engineer, tell me if that's a good idea. So I flew him out, I said, come meet the guys at Bose. And I set him up for the day with 12 different people. All of them had electrical engineering degrees. They were all doing completely different, unrelated things. It is a very flexible degree, which is awesome. So you can, some of them were hardcore, high-speed engineers, you know, doing that black magic, you know, making, ooh, how do you make that work? You know, it's just mystery, you know. And then other people were doing procurement, buying parts. Other people, I was running the business. But I, it would help that I understood it. So in my senior lecture, if this, this is spoiler alert if, the, if you haven't gotten there yet. Um, they, they had the whole room of electrical engineers and, and the professors go, okay, we want to just share with you something. 80 to 90% of everything we've taught you, you will never use. But what we have taught you is how to solve problems. And that's really what, where to go to get answers. So that's the skill set that you're gaining in engineering. And that's super valuable. Because what are we, why, why are we doing anything? We're trying to solve problems. Uh, so there's problems, as he talked with those 12 people that do all kinds of things. My point is, you can do aerospace, military, automotive, computer business, industrial, medical equipment, semiconductors, telecommunications, things we haven't even dreamt up yet, okay? AI, quantum computing, 3D printing, there are tons of opportunities. So it's a great space and a pretty cool space. I'm, I'm running too long, aren't I? Because I want to get to questions. I'll come back to this week of questions. How about that? Let me just go to uh, here. i just go to discussion. So like that, I just skipped half the slides. <laughs> well, I can always go back if, if you guys sit there and go, I have no, absolutely no questions. But let me take questions. So you've learned a little bit about me. You've learned a little bit about IPC. You've learned a little bit about the advantages of getting involved in engineering. What are your questions? Yes. Um, possibly. Uh, I, I think it's a challenge. Right. So most school systems, accredited school systems, are given marching orders about what they have to teach in order to make sure you graduate. Right. You, there's, you can always, the great thing about university, you take all kinds of electives, but if you're in an engineering path, how much extra space time do you guys have? I'm guessing not a ton. Uh, you know, oh yeah, I, I work an hour a day, and the rest of my time I've got nothing to do. You know, probably not. Um, and the problem is, is industry is constantly changing. So when see perspective is actually provide that to the schools also. So your professors can say, hey, by the way, you ought to go do this thing that IPC provides, and you can learn more about the industry so that when you interview, they'll go, wow, let's get this kid. I say kid. Sorry, I don't mean this person. I'm old now. When did that happen? I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm like... How old do you think I am? Anybody guesses? 25. <laughs> Who said 25? Who's the suck up in the room, you know? <laughs> no, just seriously. You're not going to offend me. 48. 48. 58. 88. No, right. <laughs> 56. So um, age is a number, right? In my head. In my head, I'm 103. Um, uh, don't, can't do anything. Uh, so, um, all right, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. All right, you had questions up here. Yeah, so what technologies do you see emerging in the future? Emerging future technologies. So this is like predicting the weather. <laughs> Hard to do. It depends on how far you want to look out, okay? So I mentioned a couple of them. 
AI, huge. But we're using it today. This is not the future. This is today. If you go to an electronics manufacturing facility, they're using AI right now. Um, but there's levels and definitions of AI. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You know, there's like, oh, I have achieved consciousness. We're not there. I don't know that we'll ever get there. But anyway, uh, but in terms of using data to make decisions, there's very simple. And we're probably around level two-ish. So AI um, additive technology, uh, which is, and there's different types. So you think of 3D printing. There is macro 3D printing where they're printing houses, literally printing houses. Yes, you probably have seen that. Then there's sort of normalist 3D printing. People have, I was so excited. You guys ever heard of HGTV, right? I was watching HGTV and this is probably three years ago and a commercial comes on advertising a 3D printer for the HGTV watchers. And I'm like, what? Because when I was at Bose, that used to cost 60 grand and it was terrible. It was, you know, just grinding, you know, stuff off. And it was crazy expensive and it sort of worked. Now, people pick up 3D printers like it's nothing, right? For 300 bucks, you can do some really cool stuff in your house. And then there's another section of additive which is getting really, really small, like connecting your microprocessors to something so they can connect to something so they can connect to the board. That's also additive. In fact, microprocessor technology is both additive and subtractive, right? So you've got additive, you've got 3D, oh, sorry, that's the same thing, um, uh, AI, uh, quantum computing could be really cool. They're, they're dabbling there. I just think that's ooh, fun yet. Yeah stuff. You've got materials. Are you guys familiar with, have you talked about graphene? How about, uh, I got a yes here. Any, 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 do you guys know what graphene is? Do you know what a pencil is? All right. Pencil is, uh, a graphene is a really, 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 really thin one molecule uh, thin slice of your lead. But it has some really cool properties. It's super strong, it's conductive, it's flexible, and so that it's a cool material. There's another material. What was it just? I was just borophene? Anyway, there's, there's cool materials coming out all the time that can also change the way you do things. Um, robotics. Robotics just keeps getting more and more advanced. It's, it's 40 years old. And yet, we're still doing amazing things on the robotics front. So is that kind of answer your question? Some of the emerging technologies? Or what was the follow-on? In the healthcare industry, because I'm a healthcare professional, I will know all these answers. <laughs> so I will fall to my strengths. Let me do the politician thing. She asked me a question, and I will give her the answer I want to give, whether it's related to that question or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the healthcare industry, and indeed every industry, there is electronics which is something I know something about. So in the healthcare industry, there's really cool things going on with uh, microsensors in the blood. There's also obviously like valve and communication technology. I mean, you used to have to change batteries in this stuff. And now you're finding, you know, they're using like capacitive stuff to use your, like actually the, the movement of blood or even temperatures to keep it charged. There's material stuff. How many of you, have you ever heard of nitinol? Nickel titanium alloy. It's a metal that has shape memory. It remembers. You guys don't know this? This is healthcare related. I'm getting there, trust me. Um, I did this in, so it's not new. I did this as a high school science project, as a high school student. Nickel titanium oil. You can take this, let's say, wire made of nickel titanium, and you get it hot and let it cool to a certain shape. Let's say a curlicue, right, a helix, and then it cools. Now, if you happen to, now that it's, it's in this shape, it remembers this shape. You've annealed it to this shape. If you put it in cold water, it becomes pliable. If you warm it up, it snaps back with literally something like 27 tons of force. Anybody ever wear braces? 
half of the braces in the world are made out of nitinol now because they can make it cold, put it into your mouth, your mouth warms it up, and it holds it in the right shape. You can also make perpetual engines, perpetual um, energy engines out of it. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, do, am I lying to you? Yes, I'm lying to you. <laughs> but you can do something cool. They, they came up with this. It actually exhibits not one way shape memory they've discovered. So if you put a hot bath on one side and a cold bath on the other, put a bunch of these uh, like uh, a, a spokes that can spin around it, right? And then you hang nitinol wedges from each of the spokes and you start it spinning. It will, when it hits the hot water, it springs back, which accelerates it and starts pushing it around. And then when it hits the cold, it relaxes and it basically starts an engine and starts moving itself around. But when they looked at that in the cold, it started exhibiting a secondary shape memory and actually started moving quickly back to the optimal shape as well. So just kind of cool stuff. It's not perpetual energy because you're having to put heat into the system. That's where the energy comes from. But anyway, you could put it on the moon. You could put it in the Gulf of Mexico and have hot versus cold water and just have it generate. So there's cool materials also that are used in the healthcare space. I just don't know enough about it. Is that fair? Other questions? Did you have a question? Yeah. So I was just curious. Uh, he was curious. I'd like to introduce him. He's curious. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> or he was curious. Now who are you? But I, I wanted to know, what was the biggest thing that you think you learned going to industry that college didn't quite prepare you for? And what's something that maybe we could uh, try to look forward to maybe preparing ourselves okay. for the industry? Yeah. Um, I alluded to do it to somebody I was talking to earlier. Um, you don't do individual work in the workplace. It's teams work. You work as a unit. Um, now, as I, as I shared with uh, our company, smaller companies tend to feel like they're families. And that's nice. That feels wonderful. But as I explained to them, I said, you know, we're not a family, we're a team. And they're like, what do you mean? What's the difference? How, 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 why are you making this delineation? I said, well, if my brother marries this girl who's, I don't know, a drug addict, she's family. And I have to deal with that every Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> we're not a family, we're a team. And what do I mean by that by a team? That means that if I have someone who's not performing I can bench you. And if you really don't perform, I'll trade you. So that's, that's the reality of business, OK? And it's actually sometimes a really good thing. Because think about it. I assume you guys have done team projects, right? If you have someone on your team, I'm assuming this never happens here at Valpo. But if you have someone on your team doesn't show up, doesn't pull their weight, doesn't do the work, how does that make the rest of the team feel? Awesome. No, it's, it's frustrating, right? And so it's actually doing a favor for the team to trade that player. And that's kind of, it's a hard thing. I mean, anytime you're moving employment out. So that's one of the things also to learn. It's, it's, you're playing with people's lives. I mean, that's, that's hard. I mean, what if you're the sole provider for your family and you haven't been performing and you're not making it and I let you go? Life's pretty hard right now. And yet, how do I do that as a human being? Man, that's, that's, so even if it's the right thing for the organization, it's a hard thing individually. So there are hard decisions you have to make in the workplace. It is not all roses and sunshine. Um, I don't think anybody believed that it was, but uh, so that's that's one thing I think I, I learned was that um, there there are trade-offs that you have to make it, and there's limited resources, okay, which um, you're experiencing, but you may not know you're experiencing, right? It's not like you said, oh, I'd like a personal robot assistant to help me with my project here at Valpo. Every one of us should have one of those. And you magically, they appeared, and you know these, design, these uh, Honda designed robots that they come out and they're helping you, they're bringing you your, your breakfast in the morning. I'm guessing your tuition didn't cover that. 
right? Oh, really? Is it big, that big of a tuition? <laughs> wow, I had no idea. Okay. Um, but uh, so, so there are limitations, and when there are limitations, you have to make choices. Uh, when I was working with Dr. Bose, one of the things he said was uh, he would compare his sound systems that he would design to some of these other, and people would go, oh, well, we've made a much better sounding system, and they'd spent $50,000 to create this system. And he goes, well, that's not an engineering problem. You have to have constraints. And so he said, our constraint is our systems won't cost more than $3,000 at the time. So now how do we build the best possible sounding system for every environment at that and also make money? So there's, there, are, there are limited resources and constraints. Um, you become much more aware of that uh, in, in the workplace. There are um, team dynamics. Those are similar. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to have to learn how to work with people that you might not hang out with. I, I was talking to a guy, he said, you know, there's people that you can spend three minutes with, three hours with, three days with, and three weeks with. Usually they're not the same people, <laughs> right? There's some people that's like, hi, good to meet you. After about three minutes, it's good to leave you. Um, and the next person, you know, somebody else, it might be three hours, and it might be, you know, it's, because we just have different interests or just, you know, we don't meld. But in the workplace, you might have to work with somebody that's a three-minute person for you that you're working with all day, all week, all year long. And that can be a challenge. So you have to develop some coping skills on that. But I will tell you that work environments are changing. Um, you know, back when I was, uh, you know, again, a thousand years ago, uh, just starting, um, there was... Uh, this expectation that as an employee, tough, you're there, work. You don't have opinions about the environment or what you're doing or what the company does or anything like that. You're just there to crank out the widget, whatever that widget may be. It may be a computer program, it may be a design and electric circuit or whatever. That was your job. Now, companies have become, are becoming, I should say becoming, not all companies are there, more enlightened. Right? They understand that people as employees aren't employees, they're people. Okay? We have, we're looking for work-life balance. We're looking for options. And people are very willing to go, you're not giving me the options, I'm gone. I'll go find an option over here. And frankly, in this environment, workforce, you're going to get a job. Okay? It's, it's, it's not going to be a problem. You'll get a job if you want one. Now, you may not get the exact job you're looking for, but you don't know what you want anyway. You just think you do. <laughs> Sorry. <just kidding. laughs> um, but, you no, know, it, it's a very healthy environment. When I entered the workforce, I was lucky to get a job. There were no jobs available. I, by the way, this is one thing I will tell you, and I've told it to many people I've mentored over the years. There's always a job for the best. So... Know your stuff. Hone who you are, not just your skills, but who you are. Develop those habits. One of the things that we do run into now was it, you know, what are the things that, what was the question on things we might want to know going to the workplace? So there are still real expectations. Showing up on time, uh, I assume that's relevant in the classroom as well, but the lovely thing about college, at least for me, was I didn't have to take any 7 a.m. classes if I didn't want to, right? I could start my day at 11. That usually doesn't work so well in the workplace. So you might need, now in some industries it does. So you might just say, hey, I can't do that. I got to do this. I'll find an industry that allows me to do that. That's fine too. And you can also do your own thing. Dude, that's, everybody can be in their own entrepreneur and you can do it as a side hustle and then, you know, become, you know, whoever, the next Facebook. Um, but uh, so there's some basic things. You need to respond to emails. How many of you love emails? How many of you prefer texts to emails? That's generally what we understand. You're not going to get a lot of texts from work. You'll get them from your team because they get it. But... Official communications still come in the work in email, so you got to pay attention to it because you might find out that the office was closed after you went to it uh, afterwards or, or, or something else, or you missed your trip. You know? um, 
Uh, there is an expectation in the workplace of travel in most companies. Not very much, though, really, uh, in, as an engineer. It just depends on the kind of role. Some companies, you'll have zero travel. Other companies, you're going to have a lot. So if that's important to you one way or another, understand it. Ask about it. Because, uh, but, uh, you know, I had, when I first came to IPC, most of the people at IPC had been there for an average, the, the, employee, the average tenure for an employee at IPC was over 15 years, average. That was both a good thing and a bad thing. It was good because, wow, these people are very loyal. They must like it here. They're staying. This is wonderful. It's bad in that no blood change, no different opinions, and, and doing kind of the same thing. Um, I decided to hold a team building event at a hotel, a, a, a resort hotel. And we brought the entire US team there, and it was a day and a half event. So we put everybody up in the hotel for the night, and then after half a day, everybody went home. I got a letter before the event ripping me up at one side down and, and another, saying, I can't believe you would take us away from our families for a night. They didn't sign it either. I was like, wow. But this was a little bit different organization, and they had never planned to ever do any travel. I was literally two miles from the office where we stayed. <laughs> but there was the fact that we did an overnight type of thing, and we had, you know, it was, it was a, we were trying to build team, and I was starting off in the hole now because I decided to build team. But, uh, so there's, if you have different expectations than the place you're working, you should know that going in, and you're going to struggle. If you can't adjust those expectations, go someplace that matches those expectations. Ask up front, okay? especially, like I was saying, in this environment where people are dying for people. They really are. Um, a friend of ours, Paige, um, she was serving as our on our board of directors. She was a student liaison. She was she had, very similar to Hannah. Hannah is our student liaison on my, literally my board of directors. She's my boss. Come up here. Just want you to, she literally is one of my 19 bosses. She sits on my board of directors. She could vote me off the island. Say, we're done with John. He's out. <laughs> I'm having a good time. Um, but, and that's something we, we wanted to have students experience that. Her peers are CEOs from around the globe. She's sitting at the same table with them. And guess what? You'll find out in Prague in a couple of weeks when we're there at the board meeting. They'll listen to you. They want to know what you have to say because we want to understand all perspectives, not just, oh, I'm in charge of a company, so this is what we ought to do. Well, actually, eh. They're supposed to represent the industry to me so I can do the right things for the industry. That's what they do. And we believe that we need to understand what the student population wants to know, too. And so you will be listened to. And because she's just so gregarious and outgoing, will it be, it'll be, no, no, she, you're going to have to speak up. Okay. Yeah, anyway. So um, when, when Paige... This is literally our last, we were, we were out in uh, Napa, California, and the day that we have a, a dinner with the board before our all-day board meeting, okay? So it's a Friday night, and everybody's coming in, and Paige is there, and she mentions to me, she goes, by the way, I told you I got this job. I just got an email today, and they said, because of supply chain issues, we're, res we're rescinding the offer. And now she's about ready to graduate in a couple of weeks. She has no work. And I said, oh, we have a solution here. And I trotted her around to the board member and said, by the way, Tom, Paige doesn't have a job. You need to talk to her. And then when she was done talking to Tom, by the way, Shane, Paige doesn't have a job. She had four offers by the end of the night. She actually took one of them. She's now working for one of those companies. So, the connections that you can make, and by the way, um, that's the other advantage of getting involved in these standards, it's not just to learn something. You get to sit next to a Lockheed Martin engineer, and you'll ask her questions, and she'll tell you. You'll get to sit next to a SpaceX engineer, 
and he'll tell you, you know, give you advice. You can ask all these. It's free. Many of them are online. You know, in fact, there's a summer com. In fact, our students, tell them, yeah, it's free up in Milwaukee in, I want to say it's around the 18th of May, somewhere in that realm there. Summercom is the whole, these, a lot of these uh, standards activities are there. If you want to try to get a job or learn from the industry, you can go up there, sit in a committee, and then chat with them between the things. Are you going to, you're not going to Summercom. It's, it's during Prague. Well, no, oh, it's finals. Yeah. yeah. That would be why we're not doing the student thing. <laughs> right, Aaron? We were trying to bring a bunch of high school students there so they could experience the industry, but if it's during finals week, that's a really hard time to get people to bus students in, you know, high school students in to do that. Um, so uh, connecting is the other thing. I, I think I didn't understand the value of networking, okay? And you can do that now. You should be networking with your professors, but you should also be networking with people in industry, reaching out to them. If you have a good question, Writing somebody online a good question and say, hey, I'm a student at, at, at Valpo and uh, I, I saw this article and understand you did something on this and I have a question about it, you'll get answers. And that becomes a connection. And if you follow up and, and, and value that, in other words, care for it and, and it, don't be a, um, a burden, but uh, as you do that, then those same people, when you're saying, hey, I'm looking for a job, and you say, by the way, do you have any recommendations? I'm looking for something like this. Oh, our company's got this thing. Or, oh, I know so-and-so from the industry. Let me put you in touch with that person. So the, the value of networking, I had no idea. That's how I got this job. When I finished at uh, Golden Key, I was uh, finishing up my doctoral dissertation. And for a year, I technically was unemployed. Doctorate, but anyway, I wasn't working in the industry or any industry at the time. And uh, a guy came up to me at church. He said, "Hey, John, how's the job hunt going?" And I said, "You know, there are no prizes for second place." I interviewed for several different CEO jobs, and like in one case, the owner said, "Oh, we love you. This is going to be great. I'm going to give you the job." And then the next day, he goes, "Hey, you know, the team decided you were too white collar. They're more looking for blue collar. So, you know, you became our number two choice." And they didn't give me a prize. They didn't write me a check for second place. I didn't get anything. So I was like, yeah, there's no prizes for second place. So he said, well, you know, my CEO introduced me to this guy. You should talk with him. So I talked to him. And uh, I said, well, he said, well, what can you do? And I, I went through a good portion of this ridiculous list that Hannah read this morning. It's just way too long and it bores me to tears. Um, but, uh, um, and I said, so that's what I can do. And he said, well, no one can help you. What? Didn't, did you not hear me? I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> he goes, no, no. We'd have to share every job we've ever heard of with you. That's useless. What do you want to do? And that, that's one thing I guess I would ask you. What do you want to do? And it doesn't have to be for the rest of your life. What do you want to do for the next three years? What sounds cool now? That's good enough. You may find it's cool forever, or you may say, this is really lame. Time to shift, and that's okay. Uh, and so I said, hey, I, I kind of like the nonprofit space. He said, good, because I happen to know the head of Corn Ferry, who's a big recruiting firm. She's a senior partner there, and she does nonprofit. And literally within four weeks, I was then the CEO of IPC. It was through a network connection. Um, so the value of that can't be overstated. Keep those connections. I mean, you, have, you guys are so lucky now that you have things like LinkedIn out there where you can just say, connect, connect. I used to have business cards in folders. And guess what? When they changed companies, it was all invalid, didn't work anymore, it was no good. Um, but now, people move and you go, oh, they're still LinkedIn and they've updated their content. Hey, I can still get, get a hold of them. So, but keep some of those, the, the ones that are important to you, warm because it's a small world, and you'd be surprised at how many people can help you. All right, other questions? Sorry, I, I felt like I ranted on too long. How are we doing time-wise? We're going to seven, right? Yes. Okay. I got six and a half more minutes. Any questions about anything? Yes? Did 
Did I plan my roadmap for my life and did I follow it? Um, no. So out of college, my grandfather was ill. So I went to take care of him. And a good friend of mine from college who also spoke Japanese said, hey, John, I was talking to this Japanese recruiter, and uh, you should talk to her too. And next thing I know, I was talking to the president of Alpine, and it's a funny story. He's like, oh, it says here you speak Japanese. Now, I hadn't spoken five years at that point. And I was like, yeah, sure. It's OK, let's speak Japanese. <laughs> He was Japanese. And it was funny. I was remembering the most bizarre words in the world. You know, like, well, here's the thing for, you know, ladle. I know the word for ladle. But I couldn't remember grandfather, which is like the very first word you learn, practically. But he obviously so he picked up that was it. But so different skills come into play. Um, but did I have a plan? No. I ended up going to Alpine there. Actually, my plan was I was going to become a patent attorney. Because, not, because I thought MBAs were the devil and the government the devil, so I'll become an attorney because those guys are angels, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to, I, I was like, hey, I can, I can do this law thing. But I, I actually, I, I had a plan that I was going to do that. I was going to go join a, an a engineering company, let them pay for my graduate school, which they did in... They paid for half of my MBA, so that part of the plan was sort of there. And that's a very good thing as well. If you go to the right places, they'll pay for your education and continued education. And it doesn't have to be a degree necessarily. Get certifications, get, keep growing your skills. When you graduate, don't be done with learning. If you do, you will stagnate. You need to continually learn. Um, and the world's changing. Degrees are important but now so are credentials. And you can get credentials without necessarily leaving school or maybe even companies will pay for them, et cetera. So keep doing that. But yeah, I sort of had a plan. But like I said at the beginning, I, had, I didn't even know what a trade association was either. And here I am, um, you know, running some pretty fun stuff. Make a plan though. Again, just don't worry if it has to change. I mean, I, what I would just encourage you, don't stress it. Life is going to throw you different curveballs. It's hard to predict what's going to come at it. So, okay, great. <laughs> Missed. I'm good. I'll keep going down that way. Or you'll develop new interests, maybe in another person. That might change the way you go in your life as well. So it's all good. Yeah. Hold on, rewind the tape. He says earlier, I, no. <laughs> uh, like a training or something that IPC is doing? Is that for like everybody? Or so yeah, so we do um, lots of different kinds of training. We have some online training that we're about ready to mothball that's available to um, actually students free of charge that you guys can get online that gives you a little dabbling. It's okay. It's fine. We have the new hotness that we're about ready to give to you guys here in uh, probably next fall. Um, and uh, so that's one set of stuff. Additionally, we certify over 115,000 people a year around the globe in how to do different types. Of, it, we have six different certification programs. And one is how to assemble stuff. One is the specs around assembling stuff. One is soldering. One is, you know, so it's different types of the process. We also have skills-based certifications. So in the design side, say you wanted to design electronics. There, we offer a CID credential. And that's so I'm a certified IPC designer. And then there's a CID plus. It means you've got a few more. But, and so there's the, that kind of credentials. Most recently, we've launched what we call, um, uh, it's a part of our EDGE platform kind of like education and edgy all in one, kind of cool marketing. Um, but uh, so say you flunked out or you just didn't go to college, you came right out of 
uh, high school and you wanted to start working in the electronics industry, um, we offer something called EAO, Electronics Assembly for Operators. And we can take somebody who has ha either, you know, had no experience at all. Um, they're working at a bank or at McDonald's. Maybe that's their, and that's fine. And in two days, I can have them on a line doing something properly in two days. And then there's subsequent things. So that's kind of getting them into the industry, making them some money, helping them get, their, get going. And then as they figure out what they want to do, now we're coming out with an inspector program. So you can get certified as an inspector. And then we're also doing, you know, for you guys, we offer to companies, we say, hey, guess what? For all your new engineers coming in that don't know really much about the industry, we offer EAE, Electronics Assembly for Engineers. Have you seen this? She got some credential. <laughs> right there. What's that movie? Big Hero Six? Yeah, yeah. Love that movie. Um, anyway, uh, so that's one thing that we've tried to do for the industry and said, hey, when they come in, here's 30 to 40 hours, depending on how fast they go, of material that they can grab and, and take at their leisure when they first get going so they can know this stuff without us. So that's another step. We're continuing to do upskilling, you know, like uh, you guys actually have an advantage. By the way, it's not all, it's not like everything you're learning is not useful. So I, I don't mean to say that at all. That's why I prefaced that comment beforehand. Uh, data analytics, do you guys have data analytics courses? Most of the industry doesn't know what to do with that. We're having to train them. You guys are coming in trained. AI is data analytics. That's a lot of the future, so know how to do that stuff. That's, that's a good thing. So those are the kinds of things we do. They're, when we talk, We're trying to solve a problem. That's what IPC does for the industry. We try to solve problems. On the education front, the workforce front, there's really four problems. One is pipeline. We're working with the IPC Education Foundation to help develop a pipeline of people that will come into the industry because not a lot of people are, not enough people are coming in. That's part of bringing people in. Second is like that EAO program I was talking about, which in a couple of days. One is if you have operators that come in and you want to get somebody started, well, we can do that in two days. So that's onboarding. So that's working on the problem of acquiring new workers. The other half of that problem also has two issues, and that's retention, keeping the people. So when people, how many of you think that you, when, when, what, sorry, I shouldn't say, let me, I'm just gonna tell you the answer. What's the most important part when, you're, when uh, somebody's offering you a job? What are the things that, what's the thing that you're most interested in? What do you want to hear in the offer? Just anything. What? Salary. Salary. What are you going to make? Give me, how much money? Show me the money. Yeah, okay. What else? Company culture. Culture, okay. What else do you want to know? Job description. What are you going to do, right? Okay. Who said job description? Was that you? Oh, it was you. Sorry. My ears. I need to refocus here. Yeah. Um, so these are the kind of things. What you will find, my, you remember the job that I mentioned at Alpine when I did the stereo? I always thought it would be super cool if somebody would pay me a ton of money to do nothing. <laughs> it's horrible. That is the worst job ever. I just, oh, I gotta sit here. You need something that's going to challenge you. And they actually find that people who, as you start to work, money's great, okay? It helps put food on your table. It helps put a roof over your head. It allows you to go, you know, have a phone that has somewhat fast internet connection. Exciting. Um, but it is not, as the longer you work, what's going to give you joy or give you motivation is what you're doing, who you're working with, the environment you're working with. And then money, it's like number five. But it's usually the first people everybody assumes is going to be the most important because it's like, I'm making some money. Yes. I mean, I remember when I started my first engineering job, I thought I was rich. I was making $32,000 a year. <laughs> well, I was just single. I was just myself. I, I thought I had more money than, you know, I'm trying to think of a rich person. Bill Gates. He's pretty rich, right? I didn't, but it was fine, but that wasn't what kept me interested. It was doing cool stuff. All right, we've got time for one last question. Oh, I'm over time. 
I'm over time. Any, is there any last question? Oh, let me fight through the crowd of hands. Oh my gosh, oh. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your time. If you have anything else, and Hannah knows how to get a hold of me. There you go. Thanks, guys.